It shall be like a little stream, and the little stream shall become a river, and the river shall become a great river, and the great river shall become a sea, and the sea shall become a mighty ocean, and it shall be through thee. But how thou must not know, thou canst not know. Thou shalt not know. My earliest memories were on the steamer coming from India to Britain in, when I was age five, must have been 1920. And I can vaguely remember my mother telling me not to climb on the various pieces of equipment on the deck. It was the tradition in those days that if you had a solar topi, you know what that is, a solar helmet, uh, when you left India, you attached a cord to it and you trailed it in the wake of the ship. So I can vaguely remember doing that. Well, I was in India because I was born there and I wasn't given any option about that. It, I was born there because that's where my mother was. My mother was there because my father was there and my father was an officer in the Indian Army. He was um, commissioned in what was then known as the Queen's Own Madras Sappers and Miners. And we still have his commission signed by Queen Victoria with her own hand. And uh, he did the things that engineers do. Amongst other things, he built a bridge somewhere, I think in Bangalore. And he really wasn't a religious man, but something came over him. And when he'd finished the bridge, he he had carved in it a verse from Genesis. He looked on all his works and saw that it was good. <laughs> so, uh, but as I say, he was not a religious man. He was a good man, but not a religious man. Um, I have very few other memories of India, but I have things they told me. In those days, I spoke Hindustani as fluently as I spoke English. And uh, we had several Indian servants, which was normal for white people in those days. And my father, I think he had a wrong impression, but it was good to tease little boys. So one day I was eating a melon and he distracted my attention and took the melon away. And when I turned back, there was no melon there. And the family records how I scolded all the Indian servers in Hindustani for taking my melon. But I really don't think that that's the right way to bring up little boys, because I think actually I became subject to anger, which probably started at that particular point in my life. But my parents really were very good to me. Because my father was still serving in the army in India, of course he was, spent most of his time there. And my mother was with him most of the time, not all the time. So I spent most of my early years with my grandparents. That's my mother's parents. And like everybody else in the family, my grandfather was a soldier, served in World War I, and was Director General of Transport and Supplies in India in World War I. My whole family background really is in India. He was a good man, I would say a godly man. In those days, people didn't talk about religion, it was a personal business, but I came to realize later that both my grandfather and my grandmother were in their own ways sincere believers. In fact, and I remember sometimes I would burst into my grandmother's bedroom at about seven o'clock in the evening, and she was always on her knees praying. I'm sure she was pray praying for her grandson, who had all sorts of potential problems. In fact, I really have to say, I think, one of the great influences in my life was my grandmother's prayers. Um, I had then what was called a, a governess, which was a woman who came in and kind of did what my parents should have been doing. I had a succession of governesses. And uh, then at age nine, I was sent off to a preparatory school, what they call a prep school. And there's quite a well-known photograph in the family of me about to go to prep school, suitably attired in a tweed suit with a waistcoat, 
a vest and a bowler hat at the age of nine. God has equipped me academically. I was always top of the class. I was very keen on games, football, cricket especially. Uh, at the age of 13, I was entered for a scholarship examination for Eton and I was successful. So I, at the age of 13, I entered Eton as a scholar and there were about 1,100 pupils in those days, but there were 70 scholars. The number 70 was maintained exactly because every year they took in 14 scholars, the top 14 in the examination. Eton was in many ways a strange place. I mean, there were a lot of rules. For their first year, you were not permitted to put your hands in your pockets. And until you reach a certain stage, you were only allowed to walk on one side of the street. And you always wore, well, when you were tall enough, you wore a tailcoat for everything except sports. And I remember going to W.A. Stimson, who was my tailor, and being measured for my tailcoat. And you know, I paid the whole, the, the tremendous sum of seven pounds for a completely tailored suit, including the waistcoat. Uh, Eton was a very strange place. I mean, it was extremely snobbish, but so snobbish that you didn't have to appear snobbish, if you can understand what I mean. You just took it for granted. Uh, the educational was, in its own way, tremendous. I mean, there was a proportion of one teacher to every 12 students. Um, it was taken for granted you would study Latin and Greek. Anybody who was educated always did. There was no real alternative that I know of. I remember before I was, let's say at the age of 14, I was expected to be able to write verse in Latin and Greek and translate English poetry into Latin and Greek. You might say, well, what was the use of it? Very little in a way, but it was a tremendous discipline. I mean, I was really trained to think and to work systematically to get my homework done in time. And I view younger generations today, and I see how little real discipline there is in their lives. And discipline is something that really is worth having. I mean, it can be turned in many different directions. But an undisciplined life is really a chaotic life. There's a lack of real focus and purpose. I have a real burden for the young people who are growing up in Britain today or throughout the world because there is so little of real discipline in their lives. And uh, in fact, that many people today resent discipline. But it's, it's a mistake. I mean, it can be wrongly enforced. It can be... Um, unwisely applied, but it's a key to success in life. I don't care today about the fact that I know Latin. I never bother with Latin. I do use Greek because I read the New Testament in Greek. But what I got beyond that was discipline, was study. Also, I became part of the, I wouldn't say the jet set, but because there weren't any jet sets in those days, but I became a sort of beachcomber in a way and yet, at the same time, I continued my education at Eton, so I was leading a double life. I got involved with a family of Russian emigres who had escaped from the Soviet Union. And I spent several months with them and learned Russian, which I've always regretted that I never kept it up. I also was fascinated by the Russian novelists. I started reading Chekhov, and uh, then Dostoevsky. And I was, for a long while, I was fascinated by the Russian novelists. And the whole Russian, uh, m sort of, not mysticism, but it's a kind of different view on life. Um, when I became a believer, that sort of faded into the background. But it had played a part in my development. I had friends at Eton who uh, went to Monte Carlo for a vacation and succeeded in making some money on the roulette table. So they came back and they were convinced that uh, if you knew how to play it right, you could make money. And uh, without going into all the details, we had a system devised by a man named Labouchere, 
which guaranteed you to win at roulette. Well, it so happened that they weren't able to go, and I was, so they sent me with some money, not very much money, to play on behalf of all of us. So I spent many long hours at the roulette tables. And I'd have to say, if you want to meet the ugliest people in the world, you can meet them around the gambling table. And uh, well, miraculously, we really never lost much money. I mean, later on we discovered that the man who devised the system, Labouchere, had died a pauper. So that really cured us of that. <laughs> Chapel was compulsory. Once every weekday and twice on Sundays. And uh, of course the chapel buildings were beautiful. However, when I went to Cambridge, I decided I'd done all the church going I needed to do in my early years and I wasn't going to waste my time on that anymore. I took an examination at King's College, Cambridge and was awarded the Senior Scholarship of the Year. And because both Eton and King's were founded by King Henry VI more than 500 years ago, if you were a scholar, you were a king's scholar. And if you were a king's scholar, you were entitled to write the letters KS after your name. And so because I was a scholar of both Eton and King's, I was entitled to write KS twice after my name. But it really wouldn't mean much to people today, so I don't any longer indulge that. I took both parts of what's called the classical tripos. That's the standard course in Latin and Greek history, language, culture, and so on. And in the final examination, I was passed, I passed top of everybody in the university. In fact, I was in a category on my own. So then I was granted what's called a studentship, or a, a, a studentship to study. And uh, I was deeply impacted by the philosophy of Plato in those days. So I became the senior university student in philosophy for two years. And at the end of that time, I wrote a dissertation. I can really hardly believe it, but the, the title I mean, still remember was The Evolution of Plato's Method of Definition. And on that basis, I was awarded, a, I was elected into a fellowship at King's College, Cambridge. To look back at my, my late teens and so on, I'd have to say, really, I was a hippie before there were hippies. And much of the motivation of the hippies and those who followed them was my motivation. I was dissatisfied with the status quo. Uh, I couldn't improve on it, but I didn't really want to become part of it. And, of course, being a philosopher, that's an open door into all sorts of things. I became very interested in, in uh, Indian philosophies, yoga, and so on. In fact, I would have become a yogi if I'd known how to. So I was, I was like, I mean, today there are millions of people like that. Then I was the exception. Most people weren't like that. But I've never had a problem understanding hippies or the generation of the 60s or subsequent generations. I can identify with them because in many ways I was a protester. I didn't know what I was protesting against. And my protests were usually rather meaningless, like when I spent a summer at Monte Carlo wearing sandals, I painted my toenails red. I mean, in those days, that was somewhat unusual. But I often said, why did I do it? I think just so I don't go along with all that you're doing. It doesn't make sense. So by that time, I had really arrived academically. My future was assured, but World War II had broken out. And that really threw us all into confusion. <clears throat> I remember with my fellow students, we would sit and have lunch together somewhere. We would talk about life as if it were a football that we could kick just wherever we felt inclined. After the war broke out, I realized I'd got the picture wrong. I was the football, and I was wondering where life was going to kick me next. When World War II broke out, I was aged about 24, 
I was 24 when I was elected into a fellowship in King's, in King's College, Cambridge. And uh, about the same time, I was called up. Taking the stand of a conscientious objector, I agreed to do non-combatant service. All that was a tremendous emotional crisis for me because every member of my, army, of my family that I've ever known has been an officer in the British Army. So I was definitely departing from tradition. I mean, it was a departure from tradition when I became a philosopher. But worse still, when I became a conscientious objector, but worse was still ahead for my, for my family. They didn't know it because when I was drafted or called up into the army, my one big question was, what will I take with me to read? Because up to that time, I'd have one of the largest libraries in the world at my back door. And uh, I said to myself, here I am, a philosopher. I'm supposed to be an expert. But there's one book of philosophy in the world that I know very little about, and it's the most widely read and most influential book in the history of the human language. And of course, I was referring to the Bible, which I considered to be a work of philosophy. So I knew I would have very little room to carry things in the army. So I decided I'd invest in a Bible and take that with me. So I bought myself a nice new black Bible. And uh, my first night in the army in Boyce Barracks, Crookham, Hampshire. Uh, there were 24 other new recruits. And uh, I thought, well, where do you start to read the Bible? And I said, you know, any, like any other book, you start at the beginning. So my first night in the army, sat down on the bed, pulled out my Bible, and started reading Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Well, I had no anticipation of the impact that it would make when somebody was seen reading the Bible in the army. And a sort of uneasy hush fell on the whole barrack room. Uh, but I was, I was baffled everybody, including myself, because when I wasn't reading the Bible, I didn't live the least bit like somebody who reads the Bible every day. I won't go into all the details. So, <clears throat> but I'm a determined person. So I said, I'm not going, this book is not going to beat me. I'm going to go to the end of it. And when I've read it all, I'll be in a position to give an authoritative you know, evaluation of it. Well, I plowed along for nine months and I got somewhere in the book of Job when I got invited to a Pentecostal church. Now, I had never heard of Pentecostal people. As a matter of fact, I, people, I don't think I'd ever heard of Baptists, to say the truth. I knew there were some people called Methodists who'd made trouble early on in British history. And, of course, I was a member of the church, the Anglican church, the Church of England, as they used to call it. But anyhow, this, this soldier came to me and he said, I'd like you to come with me to a place I found Sunday afternoon. And because it was Sunday afternoon and it was rather, he was rather apologetic, I concluded it was a church. So I said to him, well, I, I want to tell you I don't believe in religion, but I've got nothing to do on Sunday afternoon, so I'll be happy to come. So we went to this Pentecostal church. And I mean, I have, you have to know, I'd never even heard of Pentecostals. And it was different. There's no denying that. They sang from red hymn books. And they clapped their hands. And when they came to a chorus, they repeated it. I mean, it was a, it was a culture shock for me. Anyhow, I made up my mind. But what I really wanted to know was, did the preacher know what he was talking about? And I, mean, I had been trained to analyze and criticize for years. So the preacher actually had been a taxi driver before he became a preacher. But anyhow... Um, he took his text from Isaiah chapter 6. The year the king Isaiah died, I had a vision of the Lord, saw him in his glory, Isaiah said. And he said, Woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, dwelling in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And when I heard that phrase, I said to myself, No one ever described you more accurately than that. A man of unclean lips, dwelling in the midst of a people of unclean lips, because no group of men in the world excel the British Army for uncleanness of speech. So after that he had my attention. I thought, you know, he must know something I don't know. And he was one of these preachers who didn't stick with any particular theme or period of time. And he was going up and down the Bible and I was getting a little dizzy following him. But he got to a stage where he was talking about the shepherd boy David and King Saul 
and, the, and the, some sort of interview between them. And he emphasized the fact that King Saul was head and shoulders taller than the rest of the people. So he did this rather vivid dialogue between the two imaginary persons. And when he was speaking in the, category, in, the, in the person of Saul, he jumped up on a little bench and looked down at where he'd been when he was speaking as David. And I was following all this intently. But while he was on the bench speaking as Saul, the bench collapsed. He fell to the floor with a loud thud. And I mean, if you'd been planning something to impress a Cambridge philosopher, you would have left that part out. But as a matter of fact, I said to myself, no matter how strange this all is, he's got something I don't have. So then they came to quote the appeal. And you'll have to know, I've never been in a church where people made appeals or asked you to do anything so embarrassing as to put your hand up in public. And I couldn't understand what they were appealing about, but it got something to do with what had been happening to the man. So uh, I sat there in this stony silence. There was no background music in those days. And uh, two voices were speaking, inaudible voices, one in each ear. And one voice said, if you put your hand up in front of all these old ladies, you look very silly. The other voice in the opposite ear said at the same time, if this is something good, why shouldn't you have it? And I was absolutely paralyzed. I could not decide which voice to respond to. And then a miracle took place. A real, literal, physical miracle. I saw my own right arm go right up in the air and I knew I had not raised it. Somebody had raised my arm. And I tell you, talk about it being emotional. I was frightened. I thought, where have I, what have I got into? Well, that was all they were waiting for, this one soldier in uniform to raise his arm. <coughs> After that, they went ahead with the rest of the meeting. Nobody came up to counsel me or inquire about why I did it. But there was an elderly couple in the congregation who kept a boarding house. And they took pity on these two soldiers and invited us home for supper. <coughs> well, the army didn't feed us very well, so supper sounded very tempting. As we walked to their home from the church, this little lady of about 60 began to tell me some of her experiences. And she said that her husband in World War I had been exempted from military service because he had tuberculosis of one lung. Well, I knew enough to know that if he got exemption on that basis, it was a valid medical diagnosis. Then she said to me, I prayed every day for 10 years for, my, for, for God to heal my husband. And that staggered me. I couldn't imagine anybody praying every day for 10 years for anything. Then she said, after 10 years, I was in the parlor if you know Britain, you know what the parlor is. Praying by myself, my husband was sitting up in bed, coughing up blood. And as I was praying, an audible voice spoke to me and said, claim it. And she said, I answered out, Lord, I claim it now. And at the, that moment, her husband was instantly and completely healed in the bedroom. So I said to myself when I heard this, well, maybe this is what I've been looking for all my life. Well, we went there and we had a very good meal. <coughs> they prayed at the beginning. When I said to myself, this is part of the whole package deal, goes with the rest. <coughs> there were about seven people around the table. At the end of the meal, without any preliminaries, they started to pray again. And they were praying one by one around the table. And I looked and I saw my turn was coming quickly. And I had never prayed out loud in public. I had no idea what to say. When my turn came, I opened my mouth and I said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And my mouth shut like a trap and I couldn't say another word. And that's probably the best prayer I've ever prayed. Well, in this strange jargon that they used, somebody mentioned at the supper table, there's going to be a revival in the Assemblies of God on Tuesday. Well, I didn't know what a revival was, and I never heard of the Assemblies of God. But I said to myself, if it's the same thing, I better be there. So I was there, same sort of people, different building, different preacher. <clears throat> 
And he took his text from the statement in Genesis, Enoch was not, because the Lord took him. And he was one of these preachers who believed in making things very vivid and up-to-date, so he described how the CID, if you know, the, the, the police, just came out with their tracking dogs to trace Enoch had disappeared. And they followed the, followed the scent to a certain point, and then it ceased. So they concluded he must have gone up. And I thought, well, that's logical, you know. My logic was my field of study. Well, when he got to the end, I knew what to expect. Every head bowed, every eye closed. And if you want this, put your hand up. So I thought to myself, well, somebody else put my hand up for me last time, but I couldn't expect that to happen twice. So I put my hand up. And uh, afterwards, the preacher came to me, and I think he realized he had a problem on his hand. He'd asked me two questions. He said, do you believe that you're a sinner? Well, my specialty was definitions. So I quickly ran through some possible definitions of a sinner. And all of them described me exactly. So I said, yes, I believe I'm a sinner. Well, then he said, do you believe Christ died for your sins? And I thought it over carefully. And I said, to tell you the truth, I can't see what the death of Jesus Christ 19 centuries ago could have to do with the sins I've committed in my lifetime. And I think he was wise. He didn't argue with me. <coughs> I'm sure he and others prayed for me. Well, after that, I felt like a person suspended to, between two worlds. I'd stepped out of my familiar world, but I hadn't stepped into any other one. I was suspended. And the sort of inner pressure increased. Came about Thursday or Friday that week, and I don't remember which. I made up my mind, I'm going to pray until something happens. I had no idea what I expected to happen. Well, we were billeted in a hotel on North Bay in Scarborough in Yorkshire. And uh, I shared a room with one other soldier who was a friend of mine. We had no furniture, just two straw mattresses on the floor. But we had picked up a little folding backless canvas stool, you know, the way soldiers pick things up if they see them. <coughs> so I waited till my friend had gone to sleep, planted this stool in front of the window, sat on it, put my elbows on the windowsill, and said, now I'm going to pray. And then I ran and I couldn't pray. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know whom I was praying to. I was just lost. And I, I sat there for maybe an hour. It was getting quite late, struggling with this attempt to pray. And then, without any process of reasoning, I somehow became aware of a presence. I didn't see anybody with my eyes. And I found myself, incidentally, I had read the passage because I'd read that far in the Bible, <coughs> where a man met Jacob at a certain point in his life and wrestled against him all night. And Jacob, in the morning, said, unless you bless me, I will not let you go. And without having that consciously in my mind, I began to say to this invisible person, unless you bless me, I will not let you go. And I was saying it with great determination. And when I got to the phrase, I will not let you go, I couldn't stop saying it. I will not let you go. I will not let you go. And at that point, something moved in and began to take control of me that I couldn't understand and di or didn't recognize. And my arms went up in the air. Well, I mean, you know, an Anglican never puts his arms up in the air. And that was bad enough. But then I found myself slowly going further and further backwards on this backless stool. And I thought to myself, if I go any further, I'll fall off the stool. <laughs> and then I said to myself, I've got into this thing now. If I stop now, I may never get this far again. So I let go and I went backwards off the stool. It wasn't that I fell off, it was like I was deposited on my back on the floor with my arms still in the air, still saying, I will not let you go. And then my 
I didn't choose what I was saying, but this, speaking to this same person, I began to say more and more. And when I got to more and more, I couldn't stop saying more and more and more and more. And my arms were up in the air. I was on my back on the floor in the middle of the night in my underwear. <coughs> and I was, at that point, I had, I was no longer in control. And after a while, I began to sob. Deep sobs that shook my whole body. But I had no idea what I was crying for. It was just like something had moved in and taken control. Well then after about maybe 20 minutes, the sobs changed to laughter. And at first I began to laugh very softly. But the more I laughed, the louder it got. And I mean, after a while, the laughter was reverberating around the room. And there I was in my underwear and my back on the floor and my arms up in the air about midnight, laughing. And I thought, what will happen if anybody comes in? Well, the only person who woke up was the other soldier. And I could see him over the top of my head. And he slowly and reluctantly uncoiled from his mattress and walked towards me, keeping a safe distance. And he said, I don't know what to do with you. I suppose it's no good throwing water over you. And something inside me said even water wouldn't put this out. But having a background in the Anglican Church helped me because I remembered that somewhere in some lesson I'd read that men must not blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And without any process of reasoning, quite contrary to all reasoning, I knew that what was in me was the Holy Spirit. So I thought I mustn't make things difficult for him. So with great difficulty, I got on my hands and knees, <coughs> crawled to my mattress, got into it, pulled the blanket over my head, and went to sleep, but still laughing softly. Next morning, I thought to myself, what, what happened? Was that a dream? Was it real? The army didn't give me any time to ponder that. But the extraordinary thing was the night before, I hadn't known how to pray. The next day, I couldn't stop praying. <coughs> Even if I got a mug of water, I had to pause and thank God for the water before I could drink it. And I discovered I was really, I mean, contrary to all my natural reasoning, I was a different person. I had been a habitual blasphemer but no words ever came out of my mouth from that moment onwards. And prayer was now as natural as breathing. So the evening came and I usually went to the local pub to get a drink. I have no scruples about drinking alcohol, so I made my way to the pub, intending to go in and get my usual drink. But something strange happened. When I got to the door of the pub, my feet locked and they would not go through the door. So I had the strange experience of standing in the doorway and arguing with my feet. And then I realized I'm not the least bit interested in what's going on inside that place. I don't want to go there. So I thought I'll go back and go on reading my Bible. I went back and I was looking for the place in Job, which I'd got to, but somehow I opened in the book of Psalms, uh, one of the, what they call the Songs of Ascent, and it said, when the Lord turned back the captivity of Zion, then we were like those that dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. I said to myself, that's what happened to me. I wasn't laughing. My mouth was filled with laughter. So I then came into a relationship with the Bible, which I've had ever since, that God speaks to me through it. It's a living word. It's not just theology or history. It's God, the Father, speaking to his child. And that was really a total turning point in my entire life. Shortly after my personal encounter with the Lord, our unit was sent overseas. We were 
number one light field ambulance attached to number one armored division. We ne they never told us where they were sending us, and we were nearly two months at sea. We sailed westward almost to America, then down the Atlantic, and then eastward around the Cape of Good Hope. And we called in at Durban in South Africa for a brief stop, and then up the east coast of Africa to Suez. And that's where we arrived, I think if I remember rightly, early in December 1940. I spent the next, really the next two or three years in deserts, in Egypt, in Libya, and in the Sudan. And I learned, I think I understand why the Lord took Israel to the Promised Land through the desert. Because living in a desert is a very unique experience. Your priorities become very simple. Basically, you have three, four or five priorities. Number one is water. Number two is food. Number three is shelter. Number four is transportation. And your whole life is built around that. And uh, a lot of Eton and Cambridge was purged out of me in the desert. Not all of it, but some of it. And I became almost a friend with sand. I mean, you can't imagine how much sand plays a part in your life. It gets in your food, gets in your eyes. You have very little water to wash with. As a matter of fact, we often had more high-octane petrol than we had water. I don't know how it came about. Our um, division advanced from Egypt right through to near to Tripoli. Then Rommel came out with his unidentified tanks, and we retreated. And I took part in the longest retreat in the history of the British Army, which was 750 miles from Tripoli back to El Alamein. <clears throat> it's a very discouraging experience to be retreating continually for that length of time. Now, having become a believer, I thought I ought to pray about this. What will I pray? And I didn't know how to pray, but I felt the Lord gave me a prayer which was, Lord, give us leaders such that it will be for your glory to give us victory through them. Because I was very disappointed in the leadership of the army that I saw. Having a background in, in the military life, I expected more from officers than I saw them coming out with. So I patiently prayed that prayer every day for a long while. I didn't know what was happening, but uh, Orkinlek, who was in command in the Middle East, was replaced by another officer called Gott, who was up in the desert. Gott was flown back to take command in Cairo, but his plane crashed on landing. He was thrown out, broke his neck, and was killed. And so at that very critical stage, the British forces were left without a commander. And uh, Churchill, on his own initiative, then appointed a little-known commander named Montgomery. And uh, we knew nothing about him. Well then, <clears throat> the Battle of El Alamein was fought, and I was somewhere in the rear. The next day, I was listening to a news commentator and a little portable radio on the back, on the tailboard of the truck. And he was giving a description of the preparation of, at, at Montgomery's headquarters the night before the battle. And he described how Montgomery came out addressed his officers and men, and said, let us ask the Lord, mighty in battle, to give us the victory. And when he said that, I don't know if you can understand me, but heaven's electricity went through me from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. And God said, that's the answer to your prayer. So I have always from that time on believed that God can intervene in history if we know how to pray. At that stage, I developed a skin infection on my feet, for which the doctors offered various names, each one longer than the previous one. And eventually, they just settled with chronic eczema. 
my, uh, my officers in my unit wanted to keep me with them, but eventually I had to be put in hospital. And I spent almost a year on end in military hospitals in the Middle East. In due course, I was transferred to a place called Al Bala on the Suez Canal. And there I was visited by a very unusual person, a lady Salvation Army brigadier who had a little ministry in Cairo. Her husband had died, and according to Salvation Army regulations, she took her husband's rank, which was a brigadier. She was well up in her 70s and was just about as militant about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues as other Salvationists are about salvation. So God bless her, she's with the Lord and has been for many years. She heard about this soldier sick in, on, at the Suez Canal and she got hold of some vehicle, I don't know how she did it. She got an, an, a, a New Zealand soldier to drive her and she brought with her an American young woman, her co-worker. And they drove, I think it was about 50 miles, to the hospital. Then, fully attired in her bonnet and ribbons and everything, she marched into the ward, overawed the, sister, the nurse, and got permission for me to go up and sit in the car with them and pray. She didn't ask me whether I wanted to do that. So I found myself sitting at the back of this very small four-seater car with the American young lady beside me and the Salvation Army Brigadier and the New Zealand driver in the front seat. We began to pray and this young woman beside me began to vibrate. And I mean, she was vibrating very powerfully. And then I began to vibrate. And then everybody in the car began to vibrate. And then the car itself began to vibrate. And it was, it, the engine was not running and it was not. And I was aware that God was doing something. And then this young woman spoke in another tongue and then gave the interpretation. And I don't recall anything on the, of the interpretation except this one phrase. Consider the work of Calvary a perfect work, perfect in every respect and perfect in every aspect. Now I got out of the car just as sick as I was when I got in, but God had shown me the place to look for an answer, what he called the work of Calvary, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And over the years I've come to see that Jesus through that sacrifice provided forgiveness for sin, cleansing from sin, and healing for our physical bodies. And I've had my ups and downs at various times, but I have never, never forgotten that whole revelation that came to me. And I'm so overawed by God's mercy that he would take pity on one soldier in a remote hospital and send all that, and take all that trouble just to communicate that to me. A military hospital is a rather depressing place anywhere, but I think in Egypt or that part of the world, it's even more so. Well, I knew the Lord. I knew I, I could pray. And I just was wondering why I was sick. And uh, I became very depressed. I said to myself, I know if I had faith, God would heal me. The next thing I said to myself was, but I don't have faith. I was reading my Bible faithfully, and one day I read in Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And I latched onto that phrase, faith cometh. And I said to myself, if I don't have faith, I can get it. So then I said, well, how does it come? And the answer was, by hearing the word of God. So I decided I'm going to read the Bible through. I had plenty of time from beginning to end, and I'm going to underline certain themes with certain colors. And I chose for healing the color blue. So I started at the beginning of the Bible and read it through faithfully underlining in blue everything that had to do with healing. You know what I had at the end? A blue Bible. I mean, nothing could ever have convinced me more completely how much healing is a part of God's total provision. 
But I still had this problem that I was a philosopher. And I mean, the, the training of philosophers is to make simple things difficult. So every time I read healing, I thought, yes, but that's only your soul. God isn't interested in your body, it's just your soul. So I went along and didn't get anything until I got to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 and following. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, for they are life to those who find them, and health, and the margin said, or medicine, to all their flesh. And I said to myself, that settles it. Not even a philosopher can make flesh mean so. <clears throat> then I saw that the marginal reading was medicine. So I thought to myself, if I'm sick, the word of God can be my medicine. And being a medical orderly, I said to myself, how do people take medicine? In those days, it's changed a little now. Normally, it was three times daily after meals. So I decided that's what I would do. Take the Bible three times daily after meals as my medicine. After about a couple of months, my condition had considerably improved, but I was not fully healed. And I was discharged from the hospital at my own responsibility. I went back to the base depot in Cairo and about three days later I was posted to the Sudan. Well, Egypt was an unhealthy climate, but the Sudan was worse. In the Sudan I had very few options. I had no choice of diet. I had no, really no choice of lifestyle. All I could do was to take the Bible as my medicine three times daily after meals. I was first posted to Khartoum. But after a little while, I was sent north, up the railway line, to a railway junction called Atbara, where there was what they call a reception station. That is a little medical facility with one medical personnel in charge, two beds, some medication, dressings, really a stopping stage for people who were being admitted to hospital. So I was put in charge of this reception station at Atbara. And it was something like a luxury for me after my years in the desert, etc. Because uh, there were two beds with mattresses. And they had sheets. And they were for the patients, of course. But there were no patients. So I really indulged myself I, for, for, the last, for the first time for about three years. I didn't sleep in my underwear. I put on one of these flannel nightgowns, slept in a real bed, and I began to get a tremendous burden of prayer for the people of the Sudan, the northern Sudan, who are almost exclusively Muslim, and really had not at that time been evangelized at all. In fact, the British government wouldn't permit missionaries in that area because they didn't want to offend the Muslims. And I got this tremendous sense of the need of these people in darkness. And I got out of my bed and I began to walk to and fro, praying with my whole heart. And something really remarkable happened. My white flannel nightgown began to glow. It became really, I think, incandescent is the word. And I realized that there was a special anointing, if you could call it that, of the Holy Spirit, giving me intercession for these people. And I mean, they were not easy to love, those people. They were tough, they were unresponsive. But I got such a sense of compassion for them. So then the army soon sent me on to a place called Chibate on the Red Sea, where there was a small military hospital which catered only to Italian prisoners of war, of whom there were thousands at that time. So I ended up as responsible for the Sudani labor and for the rations and the feeding of the hospital. And I had as my assistant a Sudani named Ali. And um, he didn't read or write any language, but he, by mixing with soldiers, he learned what you could call soldier's English. He was very sharp, very intelligent. But we didn't have any kind of common ground until one day I discovered he believed in Satan. Well, I said, I believe in Satan too. So that was our meeting point, this common 
acknowledgement of Satan. Then a little while later, he, he had an appointment with me every day to meet me in my little office and plan the, the work in the hospital. He came late, and when he was late, he apologized and he said he'd been to the clinic in the hospital because he had a sore on his foot. And he showed me the sore because he didn't wear shoes. Well, I knew that the Bible said something about praying for the sick and laying hands on them. And I thought, well, maybe I should do that. I don't think at that time I'd ever seen anybody do it. So I said, would you like me to pray for you? He said, yes. So, I mean, I treated him like he was a bomb that might explode. And I gently put my hands on him and prayed a rather formal sort of prayer. and thought, that's it. Well, about a week later, he came in as usual. He said, you want to see my foot? So I said, yes. He said, it's completely healed. And so after that, we had another basis for interchange. So I said, well, I'll, I'd like to read to you from the New Testament. I don't think he knew what the New Testament was. <clears throat> so we started at John's Gospel, and I read a little passage every day, translating the King James Version into soldier's English as I went along. And he became very interested. Well, then we really became friends, and he wanted to teach me how to ride a camel. So we agreed on that, and he got two camels from somewhere, and we would go out riding in the desert. Well, then one day, I suggested we take a picnic with our camels, because I was in charge of the rations, so I had access to what we needed. So we rode out uh, quite a distance into the desert. By this time, I was reading the New Testament to him in soldier's English from John's Gospel. And uh, when we got to where we were going to eat our food, there was a little brackish trickle of water running down the hill. And he said to me, we Sudanese drink this, but you white people don't. Well, I said, I'm willing to drink it if there's nothing else. So he said, why are you different from the other white people? Well, I said, Jesus promised that if I drink anything deadly, it will not hurt me. So I drank it and never suffered anything. And I could see that impressed him. So we had our little meal, and I happened to be reading that day from John chapter 3 about being born again, and I read that. And the, the phrase being born again really gripped him. He kept talking about it, born again, what's that? So on the way back on the camels, I said, would you like to be born again? He said, yes, I would. Well, I said, listen, this evening when the sun sets, you go to your hut, I'll go to my billet, you pray, and I'll pray for you, and you ask to be born again. So next morning I met him, as usual. I said, did you pray? He said, yes. I said, did anything happen? He said, no. And I was disappointed for a moment. But then the Holy Spirit seemed to whisper in my ear, he's a Muslim. I knew very little about Islam at that time. So I said, did you pray in the name of Jesus? He said, no. When I said, if you want to be born again, you have to pray in the name of Jesus. Are you willing to do that? He said, yes. So I said, all right, this evening, you go to your hut, I'll go to my billet. When the sun sets, we pray. Next morning when I met him, I looked at him, and I said, you got it. And, I mean, his whole face was totally transformed. And all the people in the hospital that knew him and knew he was my friend kept saying to me, what's happened to your friend Ali? I said, he got saved. They said, what's that? I said, let me explain. The commanding officer at the hospital sent to me. He said, what's happened to your friend Ali? He said, he got saved. So, and really, we became very good friends. We were as uh, different as we could be in most things, but a real friendship developed between us. And I do trust the Lord that one day we'll meet in heaven. That was a, my, I think that was the first person I'd ever really led to the Lord. And of course, in view of my later experiences in the Middle East, I think it was very important I got to see the gospel works for Muslims, just like anybody else.
After a year in the Sudan, I was drafted back to Cairo. And because I'd been three years in deserts, I applied for a more humane posting. And eventually, I was sent to what was then Palestine. So I was posted to a little place called Kiryat Motskin on the shore of the Mediterranean, a little north of Haifa. I had heard about this Danish missionary that had a small children's home a little north of Jerusalem in a place called Ramallah, which was then a small Arab village. And everybody I'd met in the Sudan and in Egypt had said, if you really want a blessing, you need to go to that little children's home. So I got on a number 18 bus from Jerusalem, went out to the children's home, and arrived and found Lydia. Uh, with uh, eight small girls all around her. And uh, I was immediately impressed by the sense of peace, which was a very rare thing in the Middle East at that time. We had a strict upbringing, but she was loving. And uh, we were brought up with prayer and faith. Even I remember as very, very young, at one time we had no food, and mommy said, come on girls. So we all had to kneel down and pray and ask God to send food. I, I remember it in, exactly now, I can see it. In the morning we opened the door and there was a basket of eggs outside our door and some milk. But we never knew who brought it. So we, it is how we brought up, to believe in that God will supply all your needs, and he did. And he's still doing it, even now. Mm. Uh, mother had a, quite a ministry amongst soldiers because um, there was an, a missionary, she was a um, Salvation Army missionary in Egypt and whenever they had um, leave the soldiers that were in Egypt she would say to them, you've got to go and see Miss Christensen. She has a lovely home with children and, and she would be able to minister to you and quite a lot of them came and Derek was one of them. And uh, she made me very welcome, and we prayed together, and she gave me tea, and so on. So when I got back to Kiryat Motskin, I thought, that poor Danish lady, she's got all those children, and nobody but an Arab maid to help her, and very little money. So I said, I'll pray for her. And I was praying, and the Lord spoke to me, as he did quite frequently at that time. I would get an utterance in an unknown tongue, and then I would get the interpretation. And this time, the message I got was, I have joined you together under the same yoke and in the same harness. And I thought, that's remarkable. Does that mean we're going to work together? So then I applied for a posting, because I didn't get on well with my commanding officer. And he was glad to get rid of me and recommended the posting. So I ended up, a little while later, in number 16 British General Hospital on the Mount of Olives, and there's where I ended my military career. Being now within easy reach of Ramallah, I began to take fairly regular trips out to the children's home. And one day I spoke to Lydia and I said, on the basis of what the Lord had said to me, I said, I believe God would have us to work together. And her reply was characteristic. She said, well, he'll have to work on both ends of the chain. However, I really became more and more attached to the children's home and to Lydia. And it was like, as you could say, an oasis in the middle of a dreary military career. At that time, Lydia had relatively little fellowship with other Europeans or other non-Palestinians. So I, my visits were very welcome, and uh, we used to read the Bible and pray together. And uh, eventually, I, decided, I felt that God wanted me to be part of that children's home, which is the most improbable destination for a person with my background. So I can't exactly remember, to say the truth, how the relationship developed. But one day I said to Lydia, would you marry me? And very, without much emotion, she said yes. <laughs> so that is how we decided to get married. And most of the emotion came later.
I remember Derek coming because we had a lot of soldiers coming to our home. Our home was open to the British soldiers, anybody who used to come in for prayer. And uh, I remember Derek coming and he came again and he came again. And then one day mommy said to us, and I knew there was something going on. I mean, I'd be about 16 then. I thought there's something going on here. We often thought it was coming a lot to see my older sister because she was a beautiful girl, very beautiful. And um, it, the, the shock of our lives is when we realized he was really coming to see mother. <laughs> and one day, mommy said to us, come on girls, I'm going to tell you something. I said, what? Well, she said, this is young man. And I said, yes, Derek, you know Derek. And he's asked me to marry him. And I said, mommy, you can't. I said, we've been girls here all, our, all the time. I said, you can't have a man in this house. We've never had one before. So what do we want a man for now? You're managing good. We're doing all right. She said, just think about it. I'm getting older. And you girls one day will get, go and get married, have your own homes. And we all said, Mommy, we'll look after you. You know that. We will always look after you. That's not the point. She said, I need a bit of happiness. So we said, OK. We agreed. We like Derek. He's a lovely fellow. He is really a nice man. I didn't care for him myself, if you want my real honest. Um, after all, he came and he took mother away from us, from me. I'm talking about myself now. I was very, very close to mother. So when Derek came, it sort of kind of pushed me to one side a little bit. <laughs> and uh, when you're 13, um, it's not a very nice feeling. It was very hard for him. You think about it. I mean, all women, no men in the house, eight girls and our mother. So I think he took on a very big, heavy job to have all those girls to look after them and be our father. I don't think it was easy for him neither. Must have. So we all adjusted very well. He was there for us if we needed him. We could go to him. And he was always obliging and helping us, whatever we asked. He opened up an awful lot more to us, especially in, in my reading. It, it was wonderful. I just soaked it up. As you know, he's terrific on memorizing Bible verses. And we memorize something nearly every day. So we learned, and we learned so much more. He opened up a completely different chapter in our lives. I'm glad he came to our home. I really am. It's lovely. So he made a difference, really. So we had a mom and a dad then. Not just mommy, we had a daddy too. So it was good. But on the wedding day, I remember I just sat in the church crying. I thought, my gosh, what's going to happen now? And I even told mommy, you know what's going to happen. I mean, at one time, we were all girls. You could just run out of, to the bathroom or whatever. You didn't have to worry about anybody being there. Now we had to dress decent and walk out of our rooms. We couldn't just walk out. And she said, that's right. But she said, I need happiness too, Tikfa. You know that. I said, yes. So I'm really glad she had Derek in her life. The fact that I asked Lydia to marry me and she said yes was really rather remarkable because she was born the same year as my mother. And yet we never had any problem about that, the difference in our ages. When I communicated the news that I was planning to marry Lydia, my parents were disciplined English people, so they didn't uh, display a lot of emotion. And, uh, I mean, I was their only son, so they, all the eggs were in one basket. And uh, my father did write back and ask how old Lydia was. And I wrote back to him and said, it isn't customary to ask a woman's age. And he wrote back and apologized for that. They were really, I have to say, wonderful in their response in many ways. <laughs> well, then I had to get out of the army in Palestine, which was not normal. Uh, but by that time, I'd been appointed the chief clerk of the hospital, which was a job for a sergeant, and I was only a corporal. So I protested to the commanding officer, and he said, you are the chief clerk, so what could I say? But it worked out very well, because when I had to deal with all the official documents to get my release, I was in charge of all my own papers. So. And uh, after a certain amount of time, uh, I was, I, was, I was permitted to obtain my discharge from the army in Palestine. 
Well, about the time I was discharged, just a bit before I actually came out of the army, on the 16th of February, 1946, we got married with a religious ceremony. Uh, and it was one of those unusual days in Palestine when it snowed. So I heard later that when Lydia woke up and found it snowing, she told the children, it's too cold to get married today. Uh, but they said, Mama, you have said you're going to get married, you'll have to do it. So we met and we got married by a, a, um, a Jewish believer in a very simple ceremony without any fanfare or any, anything really to make it distinct. So I came out of the army and then a little later on the 17th of March, uh, we had a civil marriage ceremony in the uh, office of the district commissioner in Jerusalem. So I was religiously married and then legally married. And in fact, I was married. That's the truth of the matter. At the time we got married, the, the whole, the personnel of the home consisted of Lydia, eight girls, and the Arab maid, Jamila. The, of the girls, six were Jewish. One was a, an Arab from a Muslim background, and the youngest was English. Our life in the, in the home was very simple. We lived in an Arab style, and not a wealthy Arab style. Our main items of diet were very coarse bread, olive oil, which we dipped, in which we dipped the bread, and then sprinkled it with this thing called zata, which was powdered hyssop. And uh, we had milk, we had some eggs, and uh, plenty of bread and olive oil, and it ran off the children's elbows as they dipped. And all that was amazingly cheap. You could fill a, a big earthen jar of olive oil for a few shillings, and a sack of Jaffa oranges cost two shillings at that time. And really, it was a very healthy diet, in many ways much healthier than what we came to later in life when we were more, quote, civilized. The home was permeated with a spirit of prayer, because Lydia was a praying person. She was very busy. She'd be changing diapers or filling bottles or cooking, but she'd be praying all the time. And really, the children grow up, for them, prayer was something absolutely natural as natural as breathing. And when soldiers came to the home, which they frequently did, Lydia would get the children down on their knees praying while she ministered to the soldiers. And I think many British and American soldiers never forgot the impact. Much later on, I worked with John and Elizabeth Sherrill on a book about Lydia. And they were very interested to know what kind of relationship we really had. But they concluded it was a real love relationship. We really came to love one another with a very warm and lasting love. And uh, she was such an unusual person, you can't judge her by normal standards, really. And in a way, she never got old. I mean, she got old physically, but she was always full of vitality and never stodgy, never old-fashioned, although in many ways she was very old-fashioned, but I mean, it was, she was so full of life that it made, uh, uh, it made it easy. I mean, you know, God does extraordinary things if you're prepared to let him do them. I think one advantage I had was I was pretty prepared to let God do some extraordinary things, which otherwise he wouldn't have done. Obviously, he wouldn't have forced it on me. And I, I understood that, the, only I understood this after we were married. <clears throat> it said the yoke, same yoke and the same harness. The yoke was marriage, the harness was serving the Lord together. And after all, for 30 years, we served the Lord together. And uh, you know, 30 years of married life and service is not a little. And also, I'd have to say that I was the instrument of God to save the lives of the family, because probably without me, 
they would have been just massacred by the Arabs. And I'm not holding the Arabs accountable for that, that's just the way the situation was, they were enemies. During the actual war itself, there was comparative peace in Palestine between the Arabs and the Jews. When the war finished, that's when uh, tension began. And during the years of the war, the, the family had lived, although they were nearly all Jewish, in an Arab village with, with security and with good relationships. But when the prospect of a Jewish state loomed on the horizon, the Arab attitude changed radically, which one can understand. And um, we felt that we would be safer to move out of a purely Arab village and into Jerusalem. So we made many attempts, we took many trips in by bus, but somehow we never could find anything that was suitable. Eventually I said to Lydia, listen, if God wants us to move to Jerusalem, we don't have to keep going to Jerusalem. God can send somebody to our doorstep in Ramallah, which was a really rather foolish thing to say. But within a week, an Arab contractor, a, an Assyrian from Bethlehem, turned up on our doorstep in Ramallah and said, we've just finished building a house in Jerusalem. Would you like to rent it? So we took a trip in. It was much uh, larger and more high class than anything we'd ever lived in up to that time but we felt that God wanted us to move. In those days, to get into a rented apartment, you had to pay key money, which would be two years rent in advance. And for us, that was a very, very large sum of money. But it so happened that I had a life insurance, which an uncle of mine had bought for me, worth 500 pounds. So I cashed in my life insurance, put it in, and we just scraped by with enough money to move in. We moved into a house in an area which was then known upper, as, an, as Upper Baca, on a road which was then the Bethlehem Road, <coughs> but has now been turned into the Hebron Road, and the house we occupied is today number 90 on the Hebron Road. And so we were living there when the, on the 29th of November when the United Nations voted to partition Palestine and make, an, and make a Jewish state. And at that time, relationships radically changed. Up to that time, Arabs and Jews had lived together in comparative peace. But once uh, the possibility of a Jewish state came, they felt like they were enemies. And um, so in every area, well, if it, if it was a purely Jewish area, nobody moved. If it was a purely Arab area, nobody moved. But if it was a mixed area, the different groups sized one another up silently without any statements made. And the ones who thought they were weaker just moved out without taking a lot of furniture or luggage with them. Well, ours, our area in Upper Baca was a mixed area. And we said to ourselves, we're Christians and it doesn't involve us. But uh, we noticed that within a, a week or two, our Jewish neighbors had all disappeared. They concluded they, that they couldn't, they weren't equal to the Arabs in the area. And you have to remember that in our home we were a very mixed nationalities. There was British, there was a half British and half Jewish, there was an Arab girl, and the rest of us were all um, Jews, even though of course we were Christians. And we felt that neither the Arabs wanted us because they were Jews, and the Jews didn't want us because we were Christians. So we were in no man's land, more or less, really, for us. <clears throat> we received a rude awakening in a rather, very remarkable way, uh, an illustration of the marvelous foresight and provision of the Lord. 
One afternoon we received a visit in the home from a British Palestinian policeman, an English man, who came because he was seeking for spiritual help. So Lydia and I and I think two or three of the girls got together with him and we were praying. And I was on my way home and it was beginning to get sort of dark and you know how it just gets sort of dark pretty quickly. And I noticed a truck or a lorry as they call them then outside of the house full of Arab men. And I thought, what in the world are they doing here? And I realized they were talking to our neighbor. And I climbed the stairs, which were on the side of the house, to, to our apartment upstairs. And I crawled out to the veranda, which juts out to the front, so that I could hear what they were saying. And I heard one of the soldiers saying to the Arab soldier, saying to our neighbor, when do the British soldiers stop uh, guarding this section? And he said, after midnight, there won't be any more. So he said, okay. That's when we're coming to raid the home. So Johanna, with her knowledge of the whole culture and situation, realized they were intending to attack us and undoubtedly to either rape or kill the girls. And I mean, I say that objectively, that's the way the situation was at that time. So we were in the middle of a prayer meeting with this Palestinian policeman and uh, Lydia had an utterance in an unknown tongue and I got the interpretation and I heard myself saying, I have delivered thee from the snare of the fowler. And just as I said those words, Johanna burst into the room looking as if she'd seen a ghost and told us what she'd overheard and we had to decide what were we going to do. And I went back into the house and mother looked at me, she said, what is the matter with you, Johanna? You look as if you've seen a ghost. I, and I related what I had heard. So the British constable said he would go and phone headquarters. We didn't have a phone in the house. And he went and came back and he said, well, the headquarters officer says, maybe we can have a patrol in the area at midnight, but a patrol would consist of one British constable, one Arab, and one Jew. And uh, the Jew was no match for the Arabs. The Arab wouldn't fight his own fellow Arabs, so it was no protection. So about seven o'clock in the evening, we faced this crisis of what are we going to do? And we decided eventually that we had no option but to flee from the house while we could before the soldiers came back. So it was about midnight and we had to get ready. Mommy said, just put whatever you can on you girls, take whatever clothes, because we've lost everything, we lose it all. We knew that. So we all put as many clothes as we could. And I could remember us all marching. Every one of us had our Bible under our arms. Dad was at the head of the queue and all the eight girls and mommy at the back. And we walked very quietly. It was, I think, on midnight. If they had raided, I believe they would have killed every one of us. They would not have discriminated between whether it was a Jew or an Arab or a Christian. We were one family as far as they were concerned. And they would have just eliminated all of us. I, I was afraid. There was no doubt about that. But I also we believed that God was with us. And so we just walked through the dark, deserted, silent streets of Jerusalem, not really knowing where we were going. But we ended up, after about walking for about 30 minutes, at a vast sort of wall of barbed wire which surrounded a large area in the center of Jerusalem, which was called the Security Zone, which was the headquarters of the British forces, and was very carefully guarded. And nobody could get in through this wall of barbed wire without a permit, and we didn't have permits. So there we were at the entrance, not knowing what to do. And the British constable said, well, I can go in because I'm a policeman. I'll talk to the commanding officer and find out what he'll say, ask for his permission. So we stood there for about half an hour, not having any idea what the future held. 
and then the constable came back and he said the commanding officer said it all right you can come in so we filed in through the hole in the wire fence and really we had no idea where to go but we knew there was an assembly of God mission building in the center of the security zone so we headed for that and arrived I suppose about 11 p.m. and said here we are can you help us well we were ten persons and they were very helpful they it was a large building and they uh, pulled out mattresses and did various things and we all slept At 11 o'clock next morning the American missionary in charge called for Lydia and me and said through the Christian Arabs that we work with I've had a message from the Muslims in the area that if you keep those Jewish girls there they'll burn the house down so that news traveled very fast now he said uh, to me you and Mrs. Prince are welcome to stay but you'll have to find another place for the girls so we said we're all one family where the girls go we go and where we go they go so that won't work well they kept us one more night and then we were out in the streets again wondering where we should go next although this time it was daytime so we headed for what was a British Pentecostal mission in an area which was later known as the Mandelbaum Gate we arrived there and again they were very kind they took us in cared for us but this was essentially what you'd call no man's area no man's zone uh, it wasn't controlled by the Jews and it wasn't controlled by the Arabs they used to meet every night and fight it out with rifles and things like that so it was a dangerous area every time we walked past a window we had to get down on our hands and knees and crawl because we could have been shot at through the window that's where we spent Christmas 1947 early in 1948 we received a message from the American missionaries in the place where we'd spent the first two nights they had decided to return to America and they needed somebody to watch over the building in their absence so they asked us if we would like to move back into the building which of course for us was a great provision of God so we did we we moved back into the building settled in it was a large building with 23 rooms and a, a basement and a sub basement and we weren't used to such accommodation but we enjoyed it but by that time Jewish Jerusalem was surrounded by Arabs Arab forces and they had cut off all food supplies so um, the Jews were very short of food and on the verge of starvation but again God's provision was so marvelous because the American missionaries had stored some canned goods in a big box I mean a large box with all sorts of things forgot about it and left it behind so we had that provision which carried us through as long as we were in that building then the British occupying forces decided to withdraw on the 14th of May 1948 on the 13th of May about nine o'clock in the evening a British officer knocked at our door and said I just want to tell you we're moving out and tomorrow you'll be under the Jews well under the Jews we had no idea what would that entail but after a fact the Jewish civilians and the unauthorized military forces were very kind but they um, received a nice little note in rather strange English from a young man named Pinchas which in in English is Phineas and he said would you mind if we use your garden as an outpost well we knew whether we minded or not he would do it so we said we are very welcome and so they moved in and they occupied the yard the garden so we had uh, Jewish Haganah soldiers in and out through the house some of them became quite interested in our girls so we had a real good relationship with them because Lydia had been through so many um, scenes of disorder and, 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 and murder and uh, destruction she knew what to expect so we prayed every day and our prayer was very simple Lord paralyze the Arabs the remarkable thing was that these Haganah soldiers would come in 
and they'd say to us, you know, we don't understand what's happening. We move into a place and we're outnumbered by the Arabs, and yet they do nothing. They're just as if they're paralyzed. The remarkable thing was not merely did God answer our prayer, but he gave us information that he'd answered our prayer. And we had a, a real warm relationship with those young Jewish soldiers. And um, our girls were very evangelistic. So they would play church in the garden while the soldiers were there. And our Arab daughter, Kirsten, was a really quite a preacher. Of course, we were all speaking Arabic at the time. And she would give an impassioned sermon about the blood of Jesus. And then she'd come and tell Lydia, Mama, I was just telling that for the soldiers there. So those soldiers got the gospel in a way that they didn't probably expect. But we had a real wonderful relationship with them for a brief period. Well, when the British announced that they were leaving the country on the 14th of May, by arrangement with a Hebrew Christian organization, they agreed to take any Jewish Christians who would have been exposed to persecution if they had been left behind in a Jewish state. And so our four eldest girls were included. We went to this um, Church of England in Jerusalem, it's a huge building, and uh, from there they came with the uh, 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 English uh, army trucks and uh, we had the Red Cross one big truck in front of us and they put us in this huge truck there were quite a lot of us Hebrew Christians and they closed all the uh, the covers and there was another Red Cross truck behind us and I remember I don't remember much because when I got into the truck I just fainted I couldn't believe it what's happening to us and then they took us to Lid, I think it's called Lid Airport, and we went on the plane to Haifa, and from Haifa we all went on the Georgic, it's a British troop ship that was taking the British to England, so we went on the British uh, ship on the Georgic, and that was in 1948, May. But that was hard to leave Mummy and Derek and the girls behind, but we had to go, because I had a hard time also with the Jews, I was taken several times and questioned. Uh, they knew I was a Christian, and they didn't like that neither. So I was taken a few times in questions. So we've had a, a tough time. I was glad to leave, really, at the end. Meanwhile, the four younger girls and Lydia and I were left behind. And then the real f fighting broke out on the f 15th of May. And we were in a besieged city. Um, it, we could never go out of our front door because we were being shot at from the old city. We had to go out through a side door. Well, to get information in besieged city is tricky. First of all, I had to go to the civil governor, whose name was Joseph, a Jewish man from Canada. And uh, the British were by no means popular at that time, as you can imagine. And I stood in line for three hours and I got to see him I s explained to him that I wanted permission to get out of the city, and he said, you British, you stand at the end of every line and think you can go in anywhere. So I realized I wasn't going to get far with, with him. Anyhow, anyhow, he said, I can't help you. You have to go to the military governor. Well, in a besieged city, nobody tells you where the military governor has his headquarters. So I spent most of the day wandering around trying to find the military governor. When I got there, I said to myself, my mistake was I spoke English, so this time I'm going to speak Hebrew. And that really did, in a sense, create a different atmosphere. So he said, well, the last convoy is leaving Jerusalem tomorrow at 5 a.m. If you can get on, you have my permission to go. Well, the convoy took off from the King David Hotel in the center of Jerusalem which was the headquarters of the United Nations. So I had to go there to get permission to get us on the convoy. It was run by a Swedish colonel, and it so happened that Lydia and I were representing a Swedish mission in Malmö in Sweden. So again, the Lord gave me a little wisdom, and I said, I'm the representative of Evangeliska Israel's mission in Malmö, Sweden, 
and I need your help. And when I said Malmö, Sweden, the atmosphere changed. Meanwhile, the girls and Lydia had been praying that God would open the door. And as I was praying, I saw this light. I had my eyes shut, saw this light at the end of this passage, and there was a gate right at the very end of this passageway. And as I looked at it, there were two figures in white came and opened the door, or these gates. And I remember getting up off my knees and being very excited and saying, Mommy, Mommy, I'm going to England. And she said, why? And she said, well, I said, well, God's really shown me I'm going to go. And I told her about this vision that God had shown me. And um, the situation hadn't changed at all, but I had real peace in my heart that God had answered my prayer. And so we concluded that God had opened the way for us to get out. And we were intensely busy for the rest of the night, knowing that we had to be by 5 a.m. at the King David Hotel. Um, we didn't have any money. Nobody had any food. So we had just announced in the street that we were going to sell food. Well, the place was like an anthill all night. People came in and they didn't mind what they paid because money was valueless. And so by selling that food, we ended up with enough money to pay our fares, which we didn't know we were going to have to do from Haifa to London by plane. Another example of the extraordinary way that God paid full provision for everything in advance. So next morning we were at the King David Hotel by 5 a.m., and again, this marvelous provision, the Swedish colonel put on a special little truck for us. So we were the last convoy, the last vehicle on the last convoy out of Jerusalem. And we were taken to Haifa, where we were taken in by people who ministered to the Jews. And eventually we were able to take a flight, the first airplane flight I'd ever taken in my life, from Haifa to London. I had mentioned previously that the four oldest girls went ahead of us. They were evacuated by the British military, which is a little, I mean, just shows God can do anything when he gets the British Army working for you. And uh, they arrived in England without, I mean, wh where were they going? But many British soldiers had come to the home in Ramallah, and some of them had left their addresses. And one way or another, the girls got in contact with these former soldiers. And they were fairly well taken care of. Some of them ended up with my parents in Somerset. My father had just retired and settled in a rather grandiose mansion in Somerset. And he and the, the, the girls got on unusually well, as a matter of fact, which rather surprised me. And he appreciated the girls, and one of them was very interested in gardening, which he was. So there was really a good relationship developed between my parents. I have to say, in many ways, my un, non un evangelical parents were really more kind to us in some ways than some of the professing Christians. We had a very difficult time. We were scattered. We were in different homes. I had, uh, I had still had my income from Cambridge, which was very small. But really, we were just cast on the mercy of the Lord, and he sustained us. So here we were in London. Now there were eight girls and Lydia and myself, and we were really refugees. And it's hard to be a refugee anywhere, I'm sure, but to be a refugee in your own country is very testing. And we went through some real tests. However, many people were kind to us. Uh, some of the Christians took us in, some didn't. Really, the people who were kindest of all were my own parents, which really surprised me gave me a different view of my own parents. Anyhow, we prayed earnestly. I ended up in Cambridge for a while. I still had the right to live in King's College. And uh, I think it was Lydia's prayers that prevailed. We ended up in London and uh, looking for an apartment that would be big enough to hold the whole family, which was 
ten persons, which is not very easy to find, especially in central London. Well, I, I said to Lydia, let's look in the phone directory and see if there are any house agents, which was what we called realtors in those days. Well, there were no house agents listed, but there was a house agent whose name was House. So we got a hold of him, phoned him, and he said, well, I have a place which suits you, but it's already rented. Well, I said, if it falls through, will you please let us know? And we prayed earnestly, and a couple of weeks later, he said the other people were not able to take it. So that morning I had in, in my Bible reading when Jesus said to the disciples just before the Passover, go into such and such a, follow such and such a man and take you to a large upper room furnished. And when we got to this apartment, that's exactly what the top floor was built on. It was the only house in a, res in a row of houses that had an extra top floor. And there it was, a large upper room furnished. So we began to settle down in London. And uh, the girls were really rather intoxicated with London by comparison with Ramallah. It was a different sort of place. And uh, I didn't know, but th there's a place called Speaker's Corner, which all British people are familiar with. And in those days, it was much more um, popular than it is today because there were really no television. Very few people had money for cinemas. So you could get large crowds of people. And everybody had a right to proclaim his particular views. The only thing you were not allowed to do was criticize the royal family. If you did that, you would be arrested by the police. Well, anyhow, I never had any ambition to do that. So we were walking past that place once, and I said to Lydia, one thing I'll never do is preach in this place. Well, a little while later, we were back in Hyde Park and saw this crowd of men around a girl with long black hair and they were really pulling her hair and not treating her right at all. So I went over to see what was happening, and uh, it was our daughter, Rahama, and uh, she was preaching to them, I mean, to my astonishment. She had a very small little command of English language. I remember her saying to one set of men, you're all too selfishes, when you mean you're all too selfish. But she had such a, such a burden for the people that she really got through to them. So I stepped into this crowd <laughs> to tell them what I thought about the mobbing this girl. And I started to preach to them. I ended up preached three times a week for, for seven years. So you know, never say you won't do anything because you'll end up doing it. And really, we unintentionally, without planning it, built a congregation out of those meetings. And there was amongst a few people, a real hunger for God. Most of the people were callous and indifferent and uh, disillusioned because of, well, we'd, we'd won a war and lost so much and won very little for the war. So, at any rate, we would preach in Speaker's Corner Marble Arch and then invite people to number 77 Westbourne Grove, which became quite a well-known place in, that, in those circles. Well, that means getting on a bus and traveling, you know, at least a couple of miles, a little bit more. Then you had to get out of the bus and come to this private residence, climb five flights of stairs to this large upper room, which is the only, as I said, the only house in the whole row that had this extra room. And that was where we held our meetings. And we held meetings there for probably seven years. And during that time, many people came to the Lord. Many were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Some received miraculous healings. We never grew to a large number of people. God was always at work. One of the most remarkable things that I've never seen duplicated anywhere except in Scripture was one evening a man came up with, a cr with crutches who was lame and been injured. And we prayed for him and he was healed and threw away his crutches. And there was such an outburst of praise and worship. I say this very carefully, and I have witnesses for it. The whole room where we were worshipping was shaken with the power of God and continued probably for half an hour. And some of our neighbors in the street said to us the next day, what happened to your, your building up there? It was shaking. So 
So this was an objective experience, it was not something subjective. And we saw many wonderful things happen there, but always on a small scale. And eventually I felt the Lord opened the way for me to go to Kenya to become the principal of a college for training African teachers in Kenya, which was where I ended up after leaving London. The invitation to Kenya came because a Canadian Pentecostal mission had a teacher training college which was approved by the educational department of the government of Kenya, but they couldn't find a suitable principal anywhere in Canada who was willing to go to Kenya. So because one of my daughters had already ma uh, married a man and moved to Kenya, they heard about me and offered me the job and I accepted. So at the beginning of 1957, Lydia and I and the two youngest girls flew out to Kenya. The rest of the girls had by that time launched out on their own. Several of them were married. And uh, so we arrived in Kenya. And God gave, has given me over the years a very special love for the African people. It was quite exciting to arrive in Africa. And for the first time I found people who really wanted to hear the gospel. You didn't have to argue with them, you didn't have to convince them, they just were hungry. And so I ended up five years as a principal of this college. And um, we enlarged the, the college, we doubled the size, we took in women students. And uh, I remember, I think the first year that we had men and women students graduate, we had 60 students that graduated. Every one of them had been saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. And even today in Kenya, many of them are serving the Lord in significant positions. Uh, one memorable thing in Africa was we saw two people raised from the dead. The one, two of our students. The one was a man, his name was Noah Muliera. And later he became headmaster of a of a school. Well then, one of our girl students became desperately ill and Lydia and I went to visit her and by the time we got there she was dead and quite definitely dead. So I did exactly what Jesus said, I put everybody out and Lydia and I knelt on opposite sides of the bed and we prayed. And she, sat, <laughs> she suddenly sat up and said, has anybody got a Bible? <laughs> so I said, yes. And she said, read Psalm 42. <laughs> so I pulled my Bible out and read Psalm 42. Well, she was definitely, she was healed, but she was probably a little weak. So Lydia and I took her to our home for a few days, watched over her. I said to her, why did you ask me to read Psalm 42? Well, she said, and she didn't say when my spirit went out of my body, but that's what she meant. She said, I was found myself from walking in a very narrow path, and there were two men in white on either side of me. And I came to a place where there were a lot of <laughs> bright lights and people singing, and there was a man reading the Bible, and he was reading from Psalm 42. <laughs> so I wanted to know what was in Psalm 42. And it's really rather remarkable, because each of these students, quite independent of the other, had the same experience when their spirit left their body. That is, they were escorted by two men in white along a very narrow path leading to a place with many bright lights and many people singing. Then the, one other, we had many significant experiences in Kenya, but one of the, I think the most permanent in its consequences, one of our women students, her mother died. So Lydia and I drove out to the funeral I have never seen poverty so vividly portrayed. And um, they, they dug a hole in front of the African hut. And the hut had been partly damaged by fire, so its roof was incomplete. And um, the, the, the mother was buried in a dirty white nightdress in a very um, inadequate sort of box and lowered into the ground. And there were these African women, all Christians, 
singing choruses in their own language, which was the Viragodi. And um, these two little girls, very scantily dressed, running around crying. They're the two youngest daughters in the family. So the, 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 the elder sister came to us and said, I'm going to have to give up my training because I have to go and look after my sisters. So Lydia and I talked to Doma and said, we'll take your sister. <laughs> you can complete your training. So we did. So we ended up with two little, I suppose one was about three and one was about five, a little younger. I received a beautiful letter many years later from the elder girl, which I have somewhere, and she said, for the first time in my life, I slept in a real bed. I had real sheets, and somebody took me in arms and held me. So, eventually, oh, this life is so, eventually the girl graduated and she could take her sisters back, so we let them go. But Lydia said, I'll make you some cookies before you go. But we had to go to a meeting of the missionaries on the station, and very late, so when we came back, the girls were asleep. But I always remember Susanna saying to Lydia the next morning, I think you forgot to make the cookies. <laughs> so that we thought was, you know, as much as we would do. But then one day, about five o'clock in the afternoon, we were sitting in our house, and a rather strangely assorted group of people came up, uh, a black African couple and a white woman, and the white woman was carrying a small black baby wrapped in a very dirty towel. And uh, so we invited them in and they sat down. They said, uh, this little girl's mother died when she was giving birth. And the baby was found abandoned on the floor of an African hut. And they picked her up and took her to the hospital and they've kept her there for six months. Now the hospital tells us we're not a children's home we can't keep her. So we've been going around every family in this area, African, European, or Asian, and saying, will you take this little girl? And we went to the hospital, and the hospital said they couldn't take us. But they said, why don't you go to the princes, because they take children. <laughs> so when they arrived, we said, well, that was true long ago, and we couldn't possibly do that now. We have our educational work, and we're very, very busy. So they said, well, maybe sit down for a little while, we're so tired. So they sat down and we gave them some water to drink. Then they got up to go, and as the, the white woman went past me with the baby in her arms, the baby put out her left hand straight towards me, as if to say, what are you going to do about it? And, uh, I looked at Lydia, she was on the other side of the room, and normally we would never make such a decision without praying and talking together. And Lydia said, give me a week to get a crib and some baby clothes and you can bring her back. So that's how we got our ninth daughter, an African daughter. Well, we inquired about the little baby, if she had a name, and they told us, yes, it's Joska. So we all, continued, all started calling her Joska. It was several years before I discovered that really that was the way the Africans pronounced Jessica. <coughs> so I now call her Jessica, and most of the members of the family still call her Joska. Anyhow, the time came for Lydia and me to leave Kenya on furlough, and the question arose, what's going to happen to J Jessica? Uh, and I said to the various authorities, I said, if you will get her on my British passport, we'll take her with us. Well, they were completely without anybody else to take Jessica. So they wangled it and got her on my British passport. And she traveled with us to Europe and to Britain and then to Canada, where we spent a year. I was doing some Bible teaching and what they call deputational work. Then I felt the time came for us to leave Canada and I had an invitation from a, an American Assemblies of God pastor, whom I'd known when he was in the forces in the Middle East. And he'd always said, if you're ever 
in North America come and visit me. So I got in touch with him and he invited us. So we set out from Canada by train, which is a beautiful journey through the Rockies, and uh, arrived at Winnipeg, then took the train south to the American border. Well, we must have been a strange-looking group. There was me, there was Lydia, who was a lot older than I was, and there was this little black girl who was about three and a half at the time. And uh, so when we got to the American border, they said, uh, what are you coming for? And I said, I'm coming for a visit. And they said, how long? And I said, about six months. And they said, that's too long for a visit. So I've had to deal with a lot of different people at similar situations. So I said, I know you never argue with them. So I simply said, well, maybe you can help us. And they said, well, come in to Minneapolis and we'll help you to immigrate. I had never even thought of immigrating to the United States. And I mean, it was an amazing response. Also, I learned later that I had to immigrate under the Indian quota because I'd been born in India. So anyhow, I immigrated to the United States with Lydia and Jessica and uh, in due course, we became American citizens, all of us. Well, so we took up residence in Minneapolis and I became for a while an associate pastor with my friend in this Assembly of God Church. And uh, I began to make contacts and be invited to speak at various places. And then I received an invitation from Seattle, Washington to pastor a, an independent Pentecostal church there. And having a spirit of adventure, I, Lydia and I talked it over and we said, we'll, we'll take it. And now they had told us all 12 members of the board were united in inviting me. What I didn't know was the church had passed through a typical church crisis and was falling apart. But uh, when I got to Seattle, we were met on the, on the outskirts of Seattle by the only member of the board who had not resigned, because all other 11 members had resigned. And the church had been through a very typical crisis. Uh, I, I was completely innocent of American church politics, I had no idea really what was going on. Anyhow, I, I pastored there for a year and we made some very wonderful permanent friendships there. Looking back, the most significant thing that happened was that I got involved in the Ministry of Deliverance. I had no ambitions, I had no plans, but what happened was a very unusual thing a Baptist pastor called me up on the phone and said, I have a woman here in my church who needs deliverance from demons. And the Lord has shown me that you're to be, you and your wife are to be the instruments of deliverance. Well, no Baptist pastor had ever said anything like that to me before. So I, I sent up a little message to the Lord when I was still on the phone. Is this from you? And I felt the Lord said, yes. So I said, all right. We made an appointment. And for him to bring the woman with him. Well, it so happened while we were waiting for the pastor and the woman to arrive at a certain day, a Presbyterian couple who had become friends were visiting us. They had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we were four people, and then the pastor and the woman arrived. And I, you know, I thought she'll look strange and there'll be a fiery glint in her eyes or her hair will be all out of order, but she was a perfectly normal looking American housewife. So I was a little skeptical. Then the, the pastor said, and remember this is a Baptist pastor speaking, he said, she's already been delivered from one demon of nicotine, but there are more. So I thought, well, I'm <laughs> going to check this thing out carefully. So he planted her down in a chair, stood in front of her and started to shout at the demons, commanding them to manifest themselves. And uh, Obviously, there was something strange about the woman, but the demons didn't respond. So eventually, and I think he made a mistake thinking the louder he shouted, the more power he had, which is really not, not scriptural. So uh, eventually I thought, well, if he can do it, I can do it. So 
when he got tired, I stepped in front of the woman. And theologically, I knew exactly what to do. So I said, you evil spirit that's in this woman, I'm speaking to you and not to the woman. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command you to answer me. What is your name? Well, I was completely taken aback when the demon immediately answered. And it said one word, hate. And when it said hate, I have never seen such pure, undiluted hatred expressed in the eyes and the face of any person. So I thought, <laughs> I've got the answer, what do I do next? So I said, you demon of hate, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of this woman. And this surly, masculine voice answered, I'm not coming out. This is my home. I've lived here 35 years and I'm not coming out. Well, everything, I continually checked everything mentally with the scripture. And I thought, that's right, because the demon that went out of a man said, I will go back into my home. You remember? So I thought, what do I do now? So I thought, I just beat it down. So I entered into one of the most intense spiritual conflicts I've ever been in, speaking to this demon of hate. Well, suddenly, the demon changed its tactics. The woman's arms rose up, crossed over her throat, and she began to throttle herself. And I mean, it was no imagination. Her face was turning purple and her eyes were popping out of her head. So the other man there, the Presbyterian, who'd come along by accident, came with, to me and we both used our united strength to pull that woman's hands away from her throat. And it took all the strength we had to do it. And then she, ha she ceased to throttle herself. And I spoke to the spirit again, and it came out. And how I knew it came out, it was like there was a balloon inflated inside me, pressuring this demon. But when the demon came out, the woman relaxed, her head sagged forwards, her whole body slumped, and this balloon inside me was deflated. So I knew that the spirit had gone. But then I thought, there are more. So. After a while, I said, now the next spirit, I command you to manifest yourself. And without going into all the details, I think six or seven, I don't remember, six or seven spirits named themselves and came out. And hate was first, and then fear. And uh, I don't remember them all, but one that, oh, self-pity. When I heard the name self-pity, I thought, now I begin to understand why some people act the way they do. And then there was infidelity. And I realized, I mean, I, I reasoned this out afterwards, that there was a spirit in the woman tempting her to be unfaithful to her marriage vows. Well, several of them came out. And then the last one named itself as death. And again, I thought to myself, is this scriptural? But I remember that in Revelation chapter 6, there was a horse and the rider on it was named Death. So death is not just a physical condition, it's a person. So I commanded the spirit of death to come out. Well, by this time, the woman had sagged on her back to the floor. And as the spirit of death came out, she looked exactly like a dead person. There was not a sign of life. Her face was pallorless, colorless, pallid and colorless, and her skin was absolutely cold. But the spirit came out, and she lay there, relaxed, for maybe ten minutes. And then she put her arms up in the air and began to speak in tongues and praise the Lord, and I knew she was delivered. Well, that changed my whole understanding of dealing with demons. It didn't change my theology. But it, it gave me a practical approach to the whole subject. Well, then I faced my precious Pentecostal congregation. And I thought, now I begin to understand what's going on with these people. I mean, they were, I could see in their eyes and understand from their behavior that some of them had problems with the demons. But I thought, if I just tell them, talk to them about demons, they'll never receive that. So I used to skirt about the con subject. And, they sat back and an indulgent smile on their faces. A pastor has got a bee in his bonnet, but he'll be all right. And I'd helped them. They, they were grateful to me. Well, who knows what would have happened. But one Sunday morning, I was preaching my Sunday morning service. And actually, I didn't know this. This was long before the days of cassette recorders. 
but there was a man in the congregation who has become a firm friend to this day. And he was there with a reel-to-reel -reel recorder recording my message. So I, I listened to it afterwards and I was able to check whether I was accurate in what I said. And uh, I don't know what I was preaching about, but I waxed very, very bold. And my theme was, uh, my theme was Elijah. And uh, I said, in, in effect, it doesn't matter what the devil does. God has the answer. Satan had his Pharaoh. God had his Moses. Satan had his prophets of Baal. God had his Elijah. And at that moment, the young woman who regularly played the piano for the morning worship service and was sitting on her own in front, let out a piercing, blood-curdling scream and collapsed in a writhing, uh, I don't know, just writhing and turning on the floor right in front of my pulpit. So I was absolutely on the spot. I either had to prove what I was saying or stop saying it. And it didn't occur to me to stop saying it, because with the little experience I'd had in private, I knew what was going on. So, I mean, and my, my congregation were absolutely in a state of shock. I mean, their eyes and their mouths were wide open. So I thought, I need some help here, and I knew I could count on Lydia. So I called her forward, and then um, I thought I needed a little more help, and I saw the Presbyterian couple near the back, so I said, if brother and sister so-and-so will come forward. We'll minister to our sister. And at that moment, she was so different from the woman that played the piano, I really couldn't be sure that it was the same woman. Anyhow, the, the, the Presbyterian lady was very bold, and she didn't wait for anything. She started to jump up and down in front of this woman and say, you demon that's in this woman, what is your name? And out of this womb there came this gruff, masculine voice, said, my name is, we'll go no further. Well, the, the Presbyterian lady got tired, so I thought, well, it's my turn now. So I stepped up in front, I said, what is your name? And the same answer, my name is. So I was beginning to learn that you can beat demons down by prayer and by scripture. So I, I just went at it with prayer and scripture, and suddenly, uh, this demon let out a loud shout. He said, my name is Lies. And I said, you lying spirit, come out. And it refused. I still commanded it, and suddenly it came out. And when it came out, it came out with a loud roar, a sustained roar. You, no human voice could sustain a roar that long. It was like an express train going past. <coughs> then the woman who was being prayed for, sagged to the floor in a sort of heap. Well, thank God I had some previous experience, because I could have easily said, our sister's been delivered, let's praise the Lord, but I knew that there was more there than that. So, but I thought, you know, the Sunday morning worship service, that's enough for this for the time being. So I said, uh, if one of the deacons will help our sister to take her into my office, We'll continue with the service. So a deacon came along and uh, the Presbyterian brother came along and Lydia went with them. They disappeared into the office. So I thought, what do I say now? Well, it wouldn't have made any difference what I said. My whole congregation was in a state of shock. I could have told them anything. So I tried to preach and then Lydia put her head around the door and said, you better come in here quickly. And I knew she was not given to panic, so I thought something must be going on. So I said to the congregation, well, I think we've finished the service. You can go home or you can stay and pray, whatever you feel. And then I turned to go into the office, and a very godly woman who I'd come to, had come to know came to me and said, Mr. Prince, was that our daughter? And I looked at her and I said, I think it must have been. She was the only person sitting there. But she had so changed that I really wasn't sure whether it was the daughter. So she said, may I come with you? I said, by all means. Then the husband of this woman, that's the father of the girl, came too. So there was the... We went into the office, and there was the deacon and the Presbyterian brother holding the woman by her arms. And she was struggling fiercely 
And every time she got her hand free, she was tearing her clothing off. So, you know, I thought to myself, this is not the usual spectacle in the pastor's office on a Sunday morning. But thank God I'd had a little previous experience. So the mother of the girl, who was a very spiritual woman, said to me, Mr. Prince, we've been trying to make an appointment for you for several days to talk to our daughter because something has been gone wrong. And uh, she was a nurse, this mother, so she had very discreet language to describe things with. But she said, something strange has come in the, the relationship between our daughter and her husband. But then it turned out, I mean, there was a, quite a lot of talking going on, that the, the girl who had been there was the center of the thing, had developed a strange relationship with her brother-in-law, that's her husband's brother. And that I don't think there was actually immorality, but there was something wrong. Then it transpired that she and he were exchanging letters with sort of, you know, could mean something and could mean nothing. And uh, then she had in her purse, in her handbag, a letter she had written to this brother-in-law. So at that point I said, now listen, this relationship is sinful, and if you're not willing to give me that letter and watch me tear it up, I'm not going to pray for you, because you're not repentant. So it took about ten minutes to persuade her to give me the letter. So I took it from her, tore it up, put it in the waste paper basket. And then I was perfectly prepared to let Lydia pray for the woman, that's she was a woman. But I felt the Lord indicate me, no, this is your responsibility. So I put my hand on the back of the young woman, and when I did that, she slumped to the floor in a sitting position. And then I had this strange sensation, it's my job to cast the demons out. And every demon that came out, it was like it registered on the palm of my hand, like those things where you put a an airline ticket in and there's a little ding and the light shine. So, and every demon named itself. I didn't command them to, it did. And there were some very obscene sexual names. Also, one name was flirtation and another was petting. And I thought that's useful information too. So we went on for maybe, I would say at least half an hour. And then the last demon came out. And just like the other woman, this young woman was flat on her back on the floor, totally exhausted. She had no strength or whatever, and laid there for probably 10 minutes. Then she put her, her arms up in the air and began to thank God for deliverance. Well, some of the results of that were rather disappointing because the young woman who'd been delivered never came back to the church. She was too embarrassed to face the people who'd seen her. And this led me to think, what, what am I pastoring? Is it a middle-class social club that meets on Sunday mornings, or is it a place where people who really need help can come for help? So I made up my mind at that point, I was going to take, I was going to help the people that needed help if I could. And it was supernatural. It was right like this thing. Somebody had thrown a big rock into the middle of a pond, and there was a big splash. But after that, the, 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 the waves started to go out circular in all directions to the, to the verge of the pond. And, I mean, I cannot explain what happened, but people began to seek oh, Lydia and me. Mostly they came to our home. Few came to the church. I don't even know how they got to know our address. And for weeks on end, we hardly ever went to bed before about 2 a.m. Uh, people would come and tell us their stories and we would pray with them. And interestingly enough, Jessica, who was about five at that time, would sit in a corner on the couch with her head buried in her hands, and I never thought there was any danger. And then when it was all over, she said, did you get them all out? So she grew up knowing about deliverance. By the time I came along, my parents were traveling a lot because the ministry had expanded. And so I look back and I think, I don't know if I really saw them all that much, but our relationship 
was good. I mean, I remember asking my parents for a dog, and we were living in Chicago back then, and I was going to school, and I must have been in first grade, and I remember coming home, and my parents saying that we have a surprise for you, and um, so I went into the living room, and there was two poodle puppies, and I think that was one of my fondest memories, because it was such a surprise, and such a, a loving gift. We prayed uh, a lot as a family, at the dinner table, and I think um, what I've gained from my parents is a, a prayer life and seeing that they're consistent in their faith. And since I was, was like the last of the girls, I grew up as an only child. And I would think by the time I came along, my parents mellowed out a whole lot. I think they were a lot stricter with my, my sisters. <laughs> and so they probably think I was spoiled too. Yeah, boy, you know, my mother's been gone so long, and I do have fond memories of her. And um, she was much older because when um, I was adopted by them, I, she was in her late 60s, and I was six months old. But um, she was strict in the sense of of clothes and and. and I remember I was wanting my ears pierced, and she had definite ideas about that, and she liked me to wear dresses and, and not to be barefoot in the house. So, I mean, she had some rules, but um, we were close. My fondest memory would be that the week before she died, um, she and I and another lady were in the living room, and we just really would be singing and praying and dancing around the room. And it was, and that was a week before she died. So I have that as a strong memory of her. You know, a lot of people see Derek as a speaker and, and an author. And I, you know, by living with him, not that he's perfect, he has been a person that I could say I truly like. He's been one of my favorite people. Because I have a lot of respect for him. And what I would have to say, he has shown me love. Even when I wasn't lovable. And that is, it touches me deeply. I see his walk with the Lord. That is true. What you see on the pulpit is true in real life. I came to the point where I felt I had to make a decision. I could go on being a local pastor, or I could help the people that needed help, but I couldn't combine the two. So I retired from my pastorate with a very good relationship between the church and myself, and I became a traveling Bible teacher. At the same time, I uh, became associated with the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship, uh, became one of their featured speakers, and traveled quite widely across the nation in that connection. Then for a while I was associated with a church in Chicago, but I was not on the pastoral staff. And I received an invitation in the middle of the winter to preach in Miami and in Fort Lauderdale. And when Lydia and I got down to Miami and Fort Lauderdale in the middle of the winter, I said to her, listen, why are we living in Chicago when we could be living in Fort Lauderdale? because my ministry was not tied to any particular location. So we said, well, all right, let's see if we can find a house in Fort Lauderdale. And we looked around and a, a lawyer helped us and we found a really nice house for which the asking price, if you can believe it, was $25,000. So I put down a deposit of $5,000 and sound, signed a contract. Then we went to one of the local big stores, 
where Lydia wanted to do some shopping. And while we were there, I was paged over the intercom of the store, which is very unusual, they don't page individuals. When I got there, my son-in-law, who had been looking after our house in Chicago, uh, said, uh, do you have a chair handy that you can sit on? I said, listen, I don't need to sit down, just tell me the worst, what is it? When he said, the house next door to yours was completely burned down and your house has suffered a lot of fire damage. So I thought it's quite remarkable. We just paid the deposit on the house in Fort Lauderdale. So we extricated ourselves from, from Chicago, settled in Fort Lauderdale. And I traveled from there and then became associated with various different congregations in that area. I had started writing a number of books and had published a few, self-published. And um, I'd given myself the title Derek Prince Publications. And I was Derek Prince Publications. I did everything. I sent out the invoices, packed the books, took them to the post office, collected things from the post office. I was Derek Prince Publications. But uh, it was getting beyond me, so Lydia and I invited uh, our daughter Anna and her husband, David Selby, to come move down from Canada, where they were living, to Fort Lauderdale and accept responsibility for overseeing Derrick Prince Publications, which was not a very grandiose occupation. And really, I marvel at their faith that they detached themselves and moved down, because they didn't have any big offer. So we did get some kind of office and we, we developed Derek Prince publications and we had a few workers, I think most of them were family members of one kind or another. And uh, the family used to refer to this as the pub because it was Derek Prince publications. And who knows what would have happened, but gradually Things began to expand, and more and more people began to buy my books. But then in 1975, God called Lydia home, quite suddenly, without a lot of sickness. Um, about three o'clock in the morning, she had a heart attack. And with the help of one of the girls, I got her to the hospital. She was there till about three o'clock in the afternoon and then passed on to be with the Lord. By that time, I think four of the girls and I were with her. She was a very down-to-earth person up to the last moment. She was carefully telling us what to do about various practical things, including how to get her endorsement on her book, which was appointment in Jerusalem, which was just coming out. And uh, we all we all told her how much we loved her. And then she began to speak Danish. And I've learned by experience that when a person is really at the end of life, they commonly go back to their childhood language. And it's always impressed me that on the cross, one of the last things that Jesus said was in Aramaic, which was his childhood language. And then, she, as I say, she lapsed into Danish. And of course, I understand Danish. And she was saying, Tak for blood. Tak for blood, which means, thank you for the blood. And with those words, she passed into the presence of the Lord. She'd served him faithfully for 50 years in the midst of all sorts of pressures, at times very lonely, often with no one to care, to share with except her, her girls. She'd pioneered a work which few people would have been able to to see through. She was, I think of something, <laughs> she said when we were applying for 
citizenship. If you're not, if you've not become an American citizen, but you have to be interviewed by a representative of the Justice Department, and he has certain questions he has to ask you. One of them was, is, will you be willing to take up arms for the United States? Well, for Lydia, that age in her life, it was purely an academic question. But she thought it over for a moment. And she said, well, if it was for my girls, I'd fight like a lion. <laughs> and the uh, examining officer said to me, lady, he said, a remarkable lady. In 1977, I began to feel that it was time for me to return to Israel, as I knew Israel was part of my destiny. So I took a, a trip with a few younger men. During our time there, I felt that I should visit a ministry which had been translating some of my books into Hebrew and Arabic. So I went to see them. and. Uh, I'd received a letter, an official letter from them, but at the bottom written handwriting which said, your ministry has meant a lot to me, Ruth Baker. So I said to them, is there a lady named Ruth Baker who is working here? They said, yes, she's working here, but she's injured her back and she's not at work. <clears throat> well, God has given me a special ministry for praying for people with back injuries, and I've seen literally hundreds of people healed over the years. So I thought it would be very really ungrateful if I didn't offer to pray for her. So I said, would she like me to pray for her? And they phoned her and said, yes, she would. So I was being driven in a Volkswagen van by a young friend of mine, and we set out for this address which had been given to us. And we wandered around Jerusalem for about half an hour and couldn't find the address. So eventually I said to them, my friend David, I said, listen, we've done our best. We can't find her. It obviously isn't God's will for us to find her, so let's just stop and go back where we belong. Well, we stopped, and we looked out, and we'd stopped in front of the address. So then I w went in, and there was this lady on a couch in some kind of long robe, and... Uh, so I introduced myself and I said, uh, I have a rather unusual way of praying for people with back problems. I check their legs and if they're not equal, the short leg grows out and that usually means the person has been touched by God. So I said, would you, would you mind my checking your legs? And uh, she said, oh, no, all right. So I checked her legs and they were absolutely equal. So I said, that's very remarkable. I very seldom meet people with absolutely equal legs. Did anybody ever pray for you? She said, yes, you did. <laughs> so then she reminded me of a situation when I prayed for a whole number of people. When I said, there's nothing more I can do about your legs, so I just will pray for you. And I got a little prophecy for her that she was a tree of the Lord's planting that he had planted, and no one would be able to uproot her. So that, I said goodbye in a nice way and went home, and we went on to the last night that I was to be in Israel, and I still hadn't resolved the problem of, about coming back. Well, I, I went to bed that night, but I could not sleep. I was wide awake. And in the middle of the night, I had a vision, which is very rare for me. In this vision, I saw a woman at uh, the bottom of a hill, which had a winding zigzag path leading up the hill. 
and I felt the path was the way back to my place in Jerusalem. But that somehow I got to deal with this woman at the bottom of the path. And uh, as I looked, I recognized the woman I'd prayed for. So I thought, and then I felt the Lord was saying, it's my will for you to marry her. And I became really quite indignant. I said, Lord, are you asking me to marry a woman I don't know and don't love? And the Lord didn't answer that question at all. So, well, I thought it all over, and I thought, this is where Pentecostal preachers get into, pro get into trouble, so I'm going to be very discreet. I'll pray it over. So I went back to the States, prayed for a month, still felt the same, that God wanted me to marry this woman. So I thought, well, let's take a little step. I wrote her a nice, very formal letter, and said, if you should ever be coming to the United States as a, as a fellowship in Kansas City that would welcome you, I got a letter back, I'm planning to come next week, <laughs> bring my daughter to a college. So she gave me the address where I could reach her by phone. And I'm not a person that likes making phone calls. And I thought I'll have to go through with this. So I phoned the address where she was staying. And I didn't intend to give my name, but the people in the that she was staying with had listened to a lot of my tapes and the girl who answered the phone recognized my voice. So it became known that Derek Prince had phoned. So we made an appointment to meet in Kansas City, which we duly carried on. And uh, the pastor there invited us all to stay in his home. And I had a personal conversation with Ruth which didn't go into anything very deep or profound. And then I said, no, I'm going to South Africa for ministry, but I plan to be back in Jerusalem for Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And she said, I'll be there too. So we left it at that. I ministered in South Africa, received some generous honorariums. And then I sent a telegram to Ruth Baker, and I said, meet me in the King David Hotel for breakfast on such and such a day at 9 a.m. And I thought, you know, either she will or she won't. So the night before, I checked in at the King David Hotel. And next morning at 8.30 a.m., I was down in the lobby waiting to see what would happen because I only had a postbox address. If she didn't respond, I had no way of contacting her. Punctually at 9 a.m., she walked in through the door, which I learned was characteristic of Ruth. So we had breakfast together, and I knew she had been married and divorced. And I had very strong feelings about divorce. But I felt that if a party was truly innocent and the other party was guilty, the innocent party had the right to remarry. So, I mean, I spent two hours quizzing her at breakfast on the whole story and how she got married and divorced. Then we went out and sat by the swimming pool for a while. And then I said, well, we might as well have lunch together, too. So we had lunch together, and I continued with my questions. And eventually she said, I'm sorry, but I'm t too tired. I can't answer any more of your questions. So I thought, well, now is the time. So I said, well, I, might I need to tell you why I invited you to breakfast. So I told her about the dream, or that it wasn't a dream, but about the vision. And she told me later, now I understand why he's been pursuing me. She couldn't understand it. So in her own words, she looked down and looked up and fell in love with me. So that's how we arranged to get married. Well, Shakespeare said the path of true love never does run smooth. And we had quite a number of relational obstacles to overcome before we got married. But we did. 17th of October, 1978, we were married in a hotel in Fort Lauderdale. And we'd said, well, let's, let's keep a quiet marriage. We get married on a Tuesday. Nobody ever comes to a marriage on a Tuesday. But God simply outplanned us. And we ended up with a, a wedding party about the number of people we'd expected to get to the marriage. And there were at least 600 people in the marriage. But it was a very, it was a celebration. It was a real wonderful occasion. The year after Ruth and I married, 
I felt the Lord speaking to me to start a radio Bible teaching program. And I had never really been interested in radio. I didn't, just was outside my thinking. So eventually I prepared some messages and started. And uh, we were only asked on a few stations in the United States to begin with. And uh, I would prepare my messages in Fort Lauderdale in a little rigged up studio. And uh, I had only one audience, that was Ruth. She sat and listened patiently and with great attention to every message that I preached. And I, I focused on her. And one day she pulled out a nail file and started to file her nails. And I stopped in the middle of my message and said, Sweetheart, what are you doing? <laughs> and I had to go back and start the whole message over again. So she learned that never to be in any way distracted because for me, she was the audience and her interest was the interest of the people. Meanwhile, Derek Prince publications had gradually become Derek Prince Ministries, a non-profit organization and was expanding, but slowly and rather erratically. And in 1984, David Selby, who was then the international direct, or the director, reported that we were going into the red at about $10,000 a month. At this point, Ruth and I took a brief holiday, ready to seek the Lord. And during this time, we felt the Lord spoke to us very clearly. And he said, the people who need your material the most can't afford to pay for it. So we came up with what we called our Global Leaders Outreach Program, by which we selected certain key leaders in many different nations and made our material available to them free of charge. Of course, we didn't cease to charge for people who could easily afford to pay. And that was a strategic move, really, because when the leaders became excited about the material, they passed their excitement on to the people they were leading. And I would say that was a very significant development and has projected my material into many, many different nations in the most effective way. And I, I, I see as a principle, if you can reach the leaders, you can reach the people. Sometimes I myself have been rather prone just to go for the people, bypass the leaders. But that, in a way, is a mistake. While I was at Kiryat Motskin, the corporal in the Royal Army Medical Corps, the Lord spoke to me very directly and personally. Uh, I spoke in an unknown tongue and then God gave me the interpretation. He said, I have called thee to be a teacher of the scriptures in truth and faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. And then there was a little pause. And then he said, for many. That was in 1944. Now at the beginning of the new millennium, I think there's no way to, to even calculate how many people my teaching has reached. My uh, radio broadcast is, they tell me, is in 13 languages at least. It's in four Chinese dialects. It's in Russian, Spanish, and Arabic. So the potential listening audience for that is probably two billion people. And uh, I don't say this in any way to boast. I just say it's God's faithfulness. Also, it's God's trustworthiness. I mean, at that time, I was a very insignificant person. I was a second-class nursing orderly. And I just want to encourage anybody here, or anybody who ever listens to me, to believe that God can do just what he says he will do. And the important thing, really, is to hear what God is saying and know what he's saying to you personally, because he has a personal plan for each of our lives. But in 1978, after I married Ruth, I knew the time had come to return to Jerusalem. I've had a long connection with the city of Jerusalem, a very special relationship. I first came to Jerusalem in 1940, 
two as a soldier on leave from the British Army in Egypt. And I was then already a Christian. I was fellowshipping with a number of Christian workers. And I remember saying to one elderly Christian lady, I rather like Jerusalem. I think I'd like to live here. And she gave me a very wise and a prophetic answer. And she said, Derek, you don't choose Jerusalem. Jerusalem chooses you. And at that moment, I knew somewhere inside me that Jerusalem had chosen me. And we ended up by building quite a substantial house. And let me say, once is enough to build a house in Jerusalem. There are all sorts of complications you don't have in every place. For instance, there are three sacred days. For the Muslims, it's Friday. For the Jews, it's Saturday. And for the Christians, it's Sunday. So you get three days out of seven where you can't count on your workers. And there are a number of other problems I won't go into in detail. But at any rate, we succeeded in building a house, a really rather lovely house. But we moved later from that to a, an apartment because we felt the house was owning us rather than us owning the house. There are times when the Lord speaks very personally and directly through a passage of Scripture in a way that would not be a normal interpretation of the passage. And while I was still in the British Army in number 16 British General Hospital on the Mount of Olives, I was reading in Isaiah chapter 22 one day, and I read about a man named Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. And the Lord said, I will make him a father to the house of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the house of Judah being the Jewish people. And this is a very subjective experience, where it was like what I call heaven's electricity went through me from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. And I felt God saying something which seemed incredible, that he wanted me to be a father to the house of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I've never tried to work that out or make it happen, but over the years it has come to a point in my life where that has been fulfilled. So it is, for me, a very personal relationship that I have with the city of Jerusalem. Uh, when I married Ruth, my second marriage, we, we had a Jewish wedding ceremony. And one of the things I had to do was crush the goblet under my, under my feet and say, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her cunning. And that was not just a ceremony for me. It was actually a personal commitment to the city of Jerusalem, to which I hold myself even to this day. When I first came to Jerusalem, I suppose... There were maybe half a dozen real Jewish believers in the whole city. Maybe that's a slight understatement, but very much. At this time, there are probably nearly 20 Hebrew-speaking Jewish congregations in this city alone. So though we might in a way regard it as still a rather small proportion, it has grown in remarkable strides since we since, we, since I first came to know this city. About this time, our ministry was expanding in two different directions. Ruth and I, personally, were traveling very widely. And I made a little reckoning, reckoning some years ago that I had preached in at least 50 nations. And now that number must be greater. And Ruth and I made, I think, four round-the-world journeys of preaching, one of which lasted seven months. But in the same time, the, uh, the, uh, the distribution of my books and teaching material was also expanding in some rather remarkable ways, which were a clear indication that it was God's doing. For instance, around about 1977, I think, I went to New Zealand for some meetings, and a young man came up to me and said, uh, I still remarkable. I think this is remarkable. He said, uh, he gave me some stationery to sign some letters, and the stationery said, Derek Prince Ministries, New Zealand. So I said, you mean to say we have a Derek Prince Ministries in New Zealand? He said, I had to do, because you're on the radio, and people keep writing in, and I had to have something. So that's how Derek Prince Ministries, New Zealand, started. It started without my even being aware that it was there. And I'd have to say New Zealand has been a faithful and loyal friend to Derek Prince Ministries for m many, many years. In fact, 
I've been on the air through the Christian radio program there, I think consecutively, without ceasing, for at least 20 years, every day. And I meet people all over the world to say, I listen to you every morning at 6.30 a.m. And that, that for that I take no credit whatever. It is solely the work of the Christians of New Zealand. Another remarkable thing that happened, and I'm not exactly clear about my dates, but I think it was about 1983, we received a communication from an Englishman who was a missionary to China. And he told us that he'd been taking his prayer walk on Ra York Racetrack in England. And the Lord had said to him, take Derek Prince to China. Uh, and he at that time had not even met me. So he communicated with our office and told us what had happened. And our reply was, well, if you can get uh, my ministry on the air, we'll trust God for the finance. Uh, in order to make my message acceptable, they gave me a Chinese name, which is Ye Guangming. I can't pronounce it right. But it, I'm told it means clear light. And I think there are millions of people in China who actually believe I'm Chinese because they did the job thoroughly. I mean, everything in the program was slanted to being Chinese. In fact, my friend Ross Patterson was later in China and he was with a certain pastor and he, I think rather unwisely, said, you know, Ye Guangming is really British. And the man was so indignant he was prepared to fight him about it. So they did a very thorough job. And so that humble beginning with the radio, I think we were on, I forget, eight stations, I forget how many, has expanded to the point where we are, I think it's in 13 different languages today and it's worldwide. And again, I have to say, all the glory goes to God, but I go back to that promise that he made me that I would be a Bible teacher for many. And I really, if God had tried to show me in 1944 how many it would be, I would have been not, I would have been totally unable to believe it. Towards the end of 1998, after Ruth and I had just celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary, the Lord called her home. I have no question that the Lord did it. She was in one of the best hospitals in Jerusalem, received excellent medical care. If anything could have been done to preserve her life, it was done. But the Lord took her. And I simply have to say what Job said. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. But I feel that I owe it to Ruth, not just to myself, to complete my ministry. And uh, I was looking backwards to the time we'd had together. Now I've begun to look forwards to the time when we'll meet again. If I were to look back, which I don't do very often, I'm always looking forward rather than back, I would say the mistakes I've, been ma I've made are more in motivation than in action. I was an only child without brothers or sisters, and I was by nature a very self-centered person. And God has only delivered me from self-centeredness very gradually over time. When I look back, I I would wish I could wish I'd had a different attitude to some of my fellow Christians. Uh, seen there, there's a little song put to the tune of uh, Danny Boy, which says, he looked beyond my faults and saw my needs. 
And that's where I feel if I had to change, I would like to change and view my fellow Christians looking beyond their faults and seeing their need. And in fact, God has brought me to that place to an amazing extent because when I talk to people now and their needs are exposed, I begin to feel their need is my need. So God has been helpful, been wonderfully gracious to me and I give him all the glory. But what he's really been dealing with in me is my own character and my priorities. And they have changed significantly over the years. Of the various themes I've dealt with in my books and my other teaching, and there have been a, a wide variety of themes, I think the one which is most original in the sense that I haven't, I've never heard anybody else teach significantly on this theme is the transition from curse to blessing. And I have seen it transform lives that were apparently hopeless, for whom there was no future. But not only that, I've seen it make a great difference in the lives of Christians who were relatively successful. I think the whole Western world has lost the understanding of what a curse is. Now, when you move outside of Europe or America, if you move to Africa or Asia or even South America, people realize how powerful and how dangerous a curse is. But uh, I feel that the people of the West are suffering under a curse and they don't understand that their diagnosis. And I have been able to help multitudes of people. But you see, I've never read another book or heard another sermon that deals significantly with that theory, with that, with that issue. And I feel it's, it's a tremendous weakness, especially in the Western church. It surprises me how much the Lord still seems to be pouring into me. I'm not producing fewer books, I'm producing more books. I've just produced a book which I consider to be very significant on husbands and fathers. And even in the midst of producing that, I've started writing a book on judging where, when and how. And I still believe God wants me to write a book on holiness and probably on a vision for the church of the future. I'm just in the Lord's hands, but it, he just pours all this into me and then again, the Lord has given me, has added to the dimensions of my ministry in a rather surprising way. I have come to see, and I'm amazed how long it took me to see it, that one of the major responsibilities of all Christians is to care for orphans, widows, the poor, and the oppressed. And God has put such a burden on my heart that I can hardly speak about without tears. This is totally a supernatural burden. It's not the process of reasoning within me. And I wonder, and I say to myself, why did God pick me? And at least I have this answer that people cannot have to say to me, you haven't been practicing what you preach, because here I am, the father of 12 adopted children, and uh, the head of a family that numbers about 150 persons. So I don't claim any credit for that. God led me into it. But I do now have a passionate concern especially for single mothers and their children. And looking back, I realized I'd never thought about it. I married a single mother twice. The first one gave me eight children. The next one gave me three. And we picked up one more in the middle, so we have 12. I am now in my 85th year, and I marvel at God's grace and mercy toward me over so many years. And here I am, still active, traveling, preaching with assignments in various parts of the globe in the year that's coming, including Benin in West Africa. And I didn't even know where Benin was when I accepted that invitation. 